also different uh, courses in the MA program and BA program. He also uh, other different books. The current one is uh, translation concepts and critical issue. And also a handbook of writing business letters and promotional materials. And the CV is so long, it's 18 pages. And I don't want to take a long time. So uh, he also presented in different conferences and conduct several workshops and uh, supervise different graduate students and being a member of different uh, PhD committee and also a chair for some of them. And he was also a, a MA external examiner for several MA students in USA and worldwide. Uh, in, in 2012, uh, Professor Shaya was honored by the Who's Who in the World 2012 edition, and 29th edition. Uh, the, uh, he also uh, conducted different workshops and community service and seminars in different places. Uh, okay. So this is kind of a short introduction to our speakers, Professor Shayat. And then I will, uh, now I will hand his, the mic to him so he can present the webinar. Dr. Uh, Shayat, you can start now. Uh, Dr. Hamami, I just want to make sure everybody really um, hears me well. Can you hear me? From my side, yes. I don't know others. Yeah, Can I just want to make sure. I, I know I hear you, but I, I hear you faintly. You know, not really good. And I'm, I'm, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter to me, but I just want to make sure they do hear you well. And, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and start my presentation now. Uh, they hear you loud and clear, according to the chat. Yes, but, uh, have... but before I, I do so, Dr. Hamam, uh, let, me, let me start the workshop by... Uh, thanking Doctor, uh, thanking King Khalid University for, um, you know, for at least uh, you know giving me the opportunity to host this kind of workshop on translation, and in particular, I would like to thank uh, Doctor Riyadh Saab, uh, Dean of E-Learning, and uh, Doctor Abdullah Al Milhi, Dean of the Faculty of uh, Languages and, and Translation. Uh, I also like to thank you, Doctor uh, Al Hamami, being the chair of the English department. Thank you all for making this uh, a reality, actually, because we need it overseas, not only in the Middle East, but also all over the world. Um, last but not uh, least, uh, a special thank to all the attendees who are joining us now from all over the world. Um, I hope they will find this workshop uh, extremely helpful and useful. And uh, I have to say, however, that uh, this workshop um, geared towards not only professional translators, but also to those who struggle with the concept even of translation. Uh, they struggle with, with translation when they find a complicated text and uh, they don't know exactly what to do. Uh, this workshop also is geared to, towards those who are interested in, in translation as a career maybe in the future. And also students of translation who, who, uh, who grapple with the idea of what is translation, how we translate, what should we do first and such and such. I know many of you, you know, have been uh, very busy today because in, in Saudi Arabia, as well as in other parts of the Middle East, uh, this is a working day. It's Sunday, although here in the U.S. it's a holiday. And I just want to make sure I uh, thank you and acknowledge the, the, the fact that you are dedicating this kind of time to this workshop. I'm also delighted to have all of you participating in that kind of workshop. So as you read in the summary, um, this workshop re-examines the different kind of approaches to translation. In fact, and with all honesty, I, uh, I wasn't really sure if I should have called it approaches to translation. Uh, because when we say approaches, we don't know exactly if, if you know, what goes to mind, if, if, uh, if method comes to mind, or maybe ways, or strategies, or procedures, among our, or other type labels. In fact, you know, after thinking about it and, and finishing the whole presentation, uh, the best way to represent this workshop is you know, translation techniques, uh, simply because, you know, I will be talking about the techniques. Of course, before I do so, 
I would like to go over the definition. What do you mean by translation? Uh, here's an outline. I hope you can see it. First of all, we, we would we, like to go we do, what uh, and define see what is translation. I know, I know the hundreds of definitions of translation, but I'm going to subsume all these into two or three definitions. And then we, you know, explain them exactly. So what is the intention behind this kind of definition? Uh, and then we define it. I'll, uh, I'll uh, define also what is proper translation. And we go over the skills and qualifications and knowledge versus process and then the translation techniques. There's Dr. Hamami, do you have any question? Yes. Because I can hear you in the background. We cannot uh, see your PowerPoint slides. Can, can well, you... I'm, I'm reading from it. Uh, no, no. If you go to, you see that uh, video, it, there, there's at the bottom of the... Uh, Screen said share screen, and then if you click it, you can uh, share your PowerPoint with the uh, with us, and also the others don't see the PowerPoint. I, I can only see the my PowerPoint presentation here unless. Um, if you see the video, or there, there is at the bottom there is a uh, uh, several icons. One says invite participants. And you know, when I, I click when I click on, on the Zoom cloud meetings, I only have joined the meeting. And when I join join a meeting, it tells me or even sign. Okay. Let me sign again. Maybe and there's on, a, in the same page on, on the same uh, on the in this uh, the same one. You can click share screen at the bottom. And then you can share uh, the PowerPoint there. I'm sorry, I can't. I, I don't see any of the of, of these screens. You know, I see your uh, picture on the right side, like maybe right upper side. Uh, this is uh, this is is this is your PowerPoint slide? Uh, this yeah, is, this is my PowerPoint slide. Okay, and now, now if you if, no no uh, go back go back the same thing, and click uh, uh, on the PowerPoint and it will appear. Click on the PowerPoint. Uh, if you if you uh, go at the bottom, you see share screen. And I, then, I can't hear you. Can you raise your voice? Okay, let me increase the volume. Can I, can I, Dr. Hamami, can I, can I go on sign again? And if you send me the PowerPoint. This is a, this is the PowerPoint. I'm, I'm looking at it. Do you yeah, see it? You see it in your desktop, but you didn't share it with the, uh, in the uh, with us in the room. I, I don't see any app on the, on the screen. That's what I'm saying. Let me, let me, give me, give me a second. Let me sign again. It, it seems to me, I mean, last time when I was able to check, I was, I received like an, I, uh, an no, like no, an, no. Doctor, I say, you are in the, in the room, you are in the room. So you just need to, uh, you see the, the, these uh, video uh, at the top and there is the names. If you just go a little bit on, on the same app, you will see a, a mute, start video, invite participants, and there is I don't have I this. I don't have this. Okay, no, wait, wait a second. I can see somebody here, Dr. Khalil. Can you see me? Okay, so I have invite, participants, share screen, chat, yes. and record. Yes. Which Click. one are you talking about? Share screen. Click on that one. Share screen. Okay, now I'm sharing the screen. Uh, yes, now we can see it. Do you uh, see it? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay, shall I start from the beginning now? Uh, yes, now we can see it. That's good. Okay, wonderful. Awesome. Wonderful. Okay. Good job. Um, as I was saying earlier, that uh, now you see the outline. You know, as I said, I'll be talking about translation. And then I will, I will uh, uh, you know, introduce maybe different kinds of, you know, definitions, you know, maybe four or five definitions, but I would like to subsume them into maybe one or two definitions and see why, why there's so many definitions of translation and all of them more likely overlap. And maybe sometimes even uh, for the students of translation, you know, this, uh, this tends to be very confusing. Um, we will go also all over proper translation. Like, you know, we all talk about quality of translation, but until today, you know, people have different standards, different, different, different criteria for, you know, proper translation or quality translation. We'll talk about this a little bit. And I'm going to talk about the, uh, the, you know, the skills of, you know, required, for, you know, by translators and, and whether they need qualifications or not. This is, a, this is really a tricky kind of subject. 
because you know there is a wrong there is a fallacy that you know if you have a ba in such and such or if you have a phd in such and such then you will be able to do translation and i want to shed light on uh, on that with you and i and i hope you maybe later on you can share these kind of ideas with me because uh, because the, uh, you know it's it's a mess somewhere there and then we'll talk about you know the difference between a knowledge and a process you know do we need one do we need the other uh, and then we 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 start talking about the techniques um, I'll start with uh, with what is translation. So translation is a process um, which, invo which involves the following. When I say a process, just like any process, like if you want to make a cup of tea, it's a process. You have to prepare for it. If you want to have a bypass surgery, then you, you know, there's a process. You have to, you have to, you have to, you know, you know, at least think of the, the proper way of approaching something. And in our case, it's going to be a text. So what does it involve? That process, what does it involve? It involves deciding on the approach. You know, let's say how to approach the text. Is this a literary text? Is that a legal text? You know, what strategy should I use? What, uh, you know, what, let's say, what, uh, what problems I might really be confronting? You know, these issues, you know, they are in your mind. And you're thinking about, okay, this is an easy text. It's a difficult text. Then I need to do this. I need to do that. It's not, it's not just like you look at the text, you read it, and you, try, and you start translating. That is the problem with how students sometimes, you know, fail to understand what is the process or fail to understand, you know, the, understand the, the way in which they can approach the text. So when you, you know, assuming, let's say, a teacher distributes a text to students and say, okay, go ahead and read it and start translating. That is the wrong thing to do, by the way. Because instead of focusing on analyzing, reading, you know, sectionalizing, you know, identifying the difficulties in the text, identifying the text type, identifying the target reader, who's going to be reading this? Is it the same kind of readership that, that the source text has? You know, or maybe it's a different kind of readership. Uh, is that client oriented? Is it like market oriented? Is it individually oriented? All these questions, you know, they have to be raised in the classroom. And sometimes we, you know, teacher has to introduce what we call translation brief. You know, what does this, what does he want the student to do when it comes to the text? Does he want him just to translate? Or what about, you know, creating a terminology uh, list? You know, at least, you know, before they do the translation, students should work on terms, the terms of, in the text. So the minute they understand the terms, then it will be easy for them to go ahead and translate uh, the text. Of course, there are other issues also we'll talk about them in a minute. So back again to translation. It's a process which involves deciding on how to approach a particular text. But also, while you're reading the text, while you're reading it over and over again and trying to understand what is the intent, the writer's intent, what is the function, what is the purpose of this text, who's going to be reading it, and what kind of text type, what kind of genre, you, you will be using different kind of you know, resources. Uh, and, you know, you know, there are so many resources available to the translator. And, and some of them, like at least you and I know, you know, the dictionaries. You know, these days, you know, you have electronic dictionaries and the paper dictionaries are disappearing really. Um, unless maybe we still use them overseas. Uh, so you need to use dictionaries that you trust, you know, just to look up terms of terms, look up terms uh, and the meaning, look, at, look up terms exactly in a, in a context, like in, in context, you know, because sometimes, you know, dictionaries have a denotative meaning, which means they are out of context. You, know, you need to look at the term used in the text and see exactly what out of a list of meanings, what could the term X in the source text mean in, you know, in the target text, and etc. So long time ago, we used to, uh, you know, shun away from, uh, from using, you know, uh, Google translation or maybe electronic dictionaries. Not anymore. I think that, you know, technology has, has improved so much when it comes to translation, like tools and computer applications. They're becoming, you know, a way of life for the translator and they are really helpful. I don't want the translators to uh, rely heavily on using the, on, the on, on, uh, let's say, electronic dictionaries or, or machine translation or such and such, but at least it's a way to start. And the, and the real work comes after you see exactly what the text is about. If the text is easy, there's no need even to look up terms in, you know, in the dictionary. So these kind of sources are important. And they, the translator have to be able to use them constructively. 
It's not a waste of time and spending so much time on looking up a term. And then once you, you know, decide on the approach of, of, uh, of uh, translating the text and you have all the available means and resources to you, and after you read the text two, three, four times, one is just for general reading. Second, you read and try to understand what the text is really conveying, the, 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 the main intent. And third, you're going to identify the terminology, difficult, and look up these terms in the dictionary. Once you know all these, then you start thinking, not translating, thinking about translating uh, the source text into what you call the target text. So the conclusion I'm making here about the process of translation, that translation is a process of reconstruction. Yeah, reconstructing a text from one language to another. Now, other definitions, let's say, translation is the reproduction in the receptor language of the closest natural equivalent of the source language message. First, in terms of meaning, and second, in terms of style. That is according to Eugene Nida. Eugene Nida has written maybe many applications and started with a Bible translation, okay? But what I like about this definition, that this kind of definition is geared towards translation that maintains both form and function. When I say form means language or the text structure. When I say function means meaning, you know, the content. Okay. Now, I've been uh, doing uh, studying translation, uh, producing translators and teaching translation, supervising PhD, uh, you know, dissertations and translation for almost 37 years. And it's almost, and I, I'm sure all those who are attending this kind of workshop, they do agree with me that, you know, it's almost impossible sometimes to, um, to keep both the, so, the form and the, and the function of the text. In other, in other words, uh, the meaning and the style. Let's say, think about uh, translating a short story from Arabic into English or from Chinese into French or from French into English. You know, sometimes you read the French as your target language or Arabic as your target language. Everything is clear, but it's not that easy to really render the style of the source text and the meaning exactly as they express in the source text into the target language. It's not easy. It's not easy because languages, you know, um, function differently. Uh, their language, their their linguistic systems are different, uh, and also. You know, there is a, culture, a cultural element involved here in, in both, in the source language and in the target language. So what should we do here as a, as a translator trying to understand how can I maintain both the source language message and the source language or, and, the, and, and, the, and the second, uh, sorry, the source language style in the target language. So in, probably you could do that, you know, in an easy text maybe close to being like maybe sentential, you know, translation, like you're talking about the translating a sentence or two maxima, but when it comes to a paragraph or a page or two pages where, you know, the text is, is you know, has so many different, different, uh, different layers of meaning, like for example, uh, a literary text, you have the form and you have the, 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 the meaning and form here represented by the structure. How can we convey a poem in, in, in Arabic to uh, render it into English? maintaining the same kind of rhyme and meter, that is almost impossible. It would be nice to come up with, with any kind of meter in the target language. But verse translation in literature in particular has to be rendered into verse translation in the target language and vice versa. You cannot really translate verse into prose or prose into verse because you are actually altering or altering the, the main characteristics of the text. And when I say this is difficult because you know, I mean it, it's not easy. And most of us as translators, you know, or even including professional translators, they be we believe that you know, at least as long as you convey the message, that's all that counts. But it would be, I keep telling my students, but if you could uh, maintain the message, the meaning, of the source text in the target language, but also you could try to do your best to maintain the form. That is an ideal translation. And sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't, and sometimes it's impossible, particularly when it comes to literature. Sometimes it's possible, maybe in legal text, you know, where, you know, legal is a technical language and uh, you're more likely to find one 
to one correspondence. This is a definition, in other words, geared towards you know, literary translation. So, and maybe religious text, because interpretation, you know, can you imagine interpretation the Bible, interpreting the Bible? What, what God, what, what he said, what, what uh, the prophet said, what uh, God, according to the Christian, uh, uh, you know, according to Christians, what did, what did he mean by this? Uh, in Islam, for example, what God meant here, such and such. So there is a whole theory of translation as a process of interpreting. Now, Naida, because he actually came from that kind of uh, area where his main focus was on translating the Bible. So rarely he wanted to maintain that kind of poetic image in the Bible uh, and also the maintaining the message that was even delivered by, by God, according to Christians. Just same thing for us as, you know, for, uh, for, uh, for us Muslims. Uh, when we translate the Holy Book, we need to maintain the source text as is. We need to maintain it, although sometimes, you know, it's very hard to convey everything in the target language, but we need to focus on the message. And if there is a term that is ambiguous, what do we do here? We just try to, you know, maybe put a footnote or maybe try to uh, allude to the reader or, you know, indicate to the reader that there is some kind of ambiguity or there are different opinions here and there because the form is not always easy to uh, render in the target language. That is one definition. Another definition, it's called, um, it's by, uh, by Newmark. And again, Newmark came from the same, you know, you know from the same area where Eugene Nida he came from. So translation is rendering the meaning of a text into another language in the way that the author intended the text. Um, I always tell students like, meaning is always in the mind of the writer. And what we do as translators, we always guess what what did he mean by this and sometimes we succeed sometimes we don't you know that is that is a reality in other words you know if we translating a joke it has to end up like a joke many times sometimes i i, I give students a maybe a, a text um they alter the function of the text the, the type of the text because you know you read it in arabic really it's a joke you read it in english it has no meaning or vice versa you give them a joke in english they translate it into arabic well, it doesn't make any sense, okay? So here, we as translators, we failed to render the meaning as intended in the source language. We failed to render it in the target language as that which is really expressed in the, in the, in the source language. So here we talk about, Peter Numa talks about pragmatics. You know, meaning has a pragmatic dimension, which means intention. Uh, if I tell you something, um, and behind that something, you know, there has to be a reaction, just like a joke. I tell a joke and you're supposed to laugh, okay? And if I translate this joke into English, and the minute native speakers of English read it, if they don't laugh, then I was not able to convey the meaning or the message that is intended by the source, by the source text. So I failed as a translator to... Uh, to render the, 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 the source text or that joke in the source text accurately. Also, when it comes to literature, a literary text ends up in a literary text. Same thing, I don't have to explain this uh, over, and drama ends up in a drama, and a poem ends up in a poem. So we need to maintain function with function, form with form. As I said, sometimes it's very difficult, very hard to achieve or attain, but sometimes, you know, depending on the, on the, uh, the uh, let's say the text type, depending on the translator's experience or professional experience, things might happen. The, the, let's say the more experience you have when it comes to translating and tackling these kind of issues when it comes to translation, the better the result would be. And I, uh, I guarantee that. Um, and a third, maybe other definitions, let's say translation preserves the meaning of the original in another language or form. Um, and you could see here the diagram we have transition process. You have a source language, you have a target language, and in the middle, both they have shared meaning. We as a translator, first of all, before we start even thinking of translation, we need to render, we need to discover the meaning. And once we know exactly what the meaning is, then we retell it, render it, transform it, you know, uh, you know, the same kind of meaning in the target language. So the message here 
if you look at the bottom, you know, both source language and target language, they have to have the same meaning. It's so therefore here, what Ross is uh, indicating here is that translation is retelling the meaning in the source language exactly in the, so, in the same way expressed or in the target language, exactly in the same way expressed in the source language. So it's a process. So you could see the first definition, second definition, third definition, more likely they all focus on the same thing, but also different definitions, they focus on different text types. You cannot, for example, take, uh, let's say, an, uh, like a, uh, let's say uh, an approach uh, to translate literature, but sometimes you might not use the same kind of approach to translate a journalistic text. You need to have a different kind of approach because of the text type, because of the jargon, because of the, uh, let's say, uh, target reader, and mainly the main features and the characteristics of the text. So every text requires sometimes, every text type requires a different kind of strategy, a different kind of technique. Um, let's, next one, we have other definitions like translation is made possible by an equivalence of thought, which lies behind the different verbal expressions of thought. Now, this is Savory. Savory wrote a book, The Art of Translation in 1975, and I haven't seen one like this book since the since since I graduated, you know, um, that was in 1991. Uh, simply because uh, this kind of book, The Art of Translation by Savory, 1975, it could be maybe uh, edited uh, or maybe uh, published in a different kind of version. I'm not you know I'm not aware of this really, but that is geared towards literary translation, literary translation. Um, I don't know how many of you read. Uh, let's say Najib Mahfoud or Tawfiq uh, al-Hakim uh, or Taha Hussain or Shakespeare or uh, uh, let's say Hemingway or any of those, you know, where sometimes you come, you, you know, you come across a term that you don't know exactly what the author is saying. You know, you're trying to, uh, you're trying to come to grips with, with the meaning. Why did he say that? How did he say that? You know, and for what reason? So you end up, you end up having to go through uh, culture. Maybe, maybe his childhood can really help me understand this term. So the idea behind translation here is trying to understand what was he thinking? How was he thinking? So you are translating a thought. It's not an idea. It's a thought with a thought. Why did he use this? Like, for example, we have in Arabic many proverbs. We don't know exactly what was the thought behind them. We say, who knows? You know, that is wrong translation of until today, nobody knows what was the whole idea behind this kind of problem. And people sometimes are confused. They don't know what it mean, that, that means. They don't know. So unless you know the thought behind this, or sometimes we use the word, oh, he's an Oxford graduate. What does that mean? Oxford. What was the thought that is articulated by using the word Oxford in that sentence? Are you saying he's a brilliant? Are you saying he's a clever student? Okay. So when you translate it, you know, unless this is a common ground between the source language and the target language, that all those who are actually experiencing the source language, they do know when they see Oxford, Oxford is an excellent school, then there is a shared knowledge between the source, target, the source language and the target, source language reader and the target language reader. So if you convey he is an Oxford graduate, إنه خريج جامعة أكسفورد, okay, then the meaning, the thought is already, is, is, is perfectly expressed. But what if the, the target language reader is not aware of the University of Oxford? How would you convey that kind of thought? So I would, my, my strategy would be to convey Oxford into a brilliant kind of student. Unless, as I said, Oxford indicates to the target language reader that that's what it means. So pay attention. I'm, I'm, I'm calling on all of you, whether you're students of translation, colleagues, teaching translation, and professional translators, that these, these issues are extremely important. And we need to make sure that our students do understand the implications behind an idea and a thought. When we say, for example, jihad, there's a thought behind jihad. What does it mean? 
it's not a, it's not one word. You know, sometimes maybe you can write a whole page on a definition on one word. So make sure the choice you have, you know, the choice you have is accurately selected so it can really mirror or maybe portray the same kind of meaning, the same kind of thought expressed by that word in the source language. Um, then we have translation, transferring the ideas and thoughts together and concepts accurately and contextually from one language to another, i.e. from Arabic into English. And that is in one of my books, uh, textbook of translation published by uh, a Belgian publishing company in 19, 2000, 2006. And here we have, without pain, we would not know joy. If you look at, if you look at the definition here, we have ideas, we have thoughts, and we have concepts. We try to figure out exactly what, you know, min here, min dun al alam. Min means from, dun means without, al alam means pain. Len means we would not. Na'rifu, we know, or we know. As saada means happiness. Now, you could translate it literally to mean without pain, we will not know happiness. We will not know happiness, okay? Now, here, happiness or joy, there's a different implication between happiness and joy. And I am sure you agree with me. If you go into parallel text in English, rarely you're going to find this particular, uh, let's say, uh, statement. Um, uh, you know, that the, the word sa'ada here is, uh, is being rendered into happiness. You know, so you, without pain, look at the al-tarif in the Arabic, the definite article in Arabic, without min dunil alami. We cannot say in Arabic or in English. We cannot say without the pain. Then what pain? Although it is defined in Arabic, in English it is not defined. You know, because we're not really focusing on the structure here. We are focusing on the meaning. We are focusing on the thought behind it. So we say without pain, we would not know joy. Joy equivalent to sa'ada. But why can't we say happiness? Well, we can say happiness, but that's not common in English. You know, if you go online and you just write without pain, we would, we would know joy, you'll find it. But if you say without pain, we would know happiness. It doesn't. So you as a professional translator, you as a teacher of translator, a translation, you need to know what is common in English. Although you're violating the culture, the structural rule about the Arabic, at the end of the day, you're giving the English reader uh, the language that he or she expects. Otherwise, it would not really be correct if we say without the pain, that's what some, some of my students would do that. The, without the pain, we would not know happiness. Well, so if this is read by a native speaker of English, he would, he would tell you, we don't say that. Then what was the, what was the idea behind, uh, behind the, the source text? So again, um, you need always to match the Arabic in terms of meaning and concept in terms of uh, context to that of the target language. So, you know, functionally speaking, without pain, we would not know joy. That would be almost, almost 100% equivalent to min dunil alami lan na'if al-sa'ada. The focus here is on meaning, not on structure. Because if you focus on structure, you end up having incorrect English language. Okay? Uh, and we move forward. I know, I don't know if, you know, almost we have an hour. We've been, we've been doing this for an hour. I want to make sure I cover everything. And there's something called in translation intuition, like translation is intuition, or specialization. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Let me just drink a little bit because it would help. <clears throat> Excuse me. Intuition. Now, there is an argument, you know, somewhere, everywhere, in Europe, in the U.S., in the Middle East, but probably in the Middle East, it's, it's more common. It, it, it's more, it's uh, more live, let's say, because, you know, you, get, you, have a, you have a kind of argument that, you know, well, translation, anybody can translate. As long as you know the English language, oh, everything is fine. That's not really true. Yeah, this is a fallacy. And I uh, wrote a chapter in, in, in one of my books on fallacies of translation. Um, because, you know, if we continue to think like this, you know, translation, we're not going to go anywhere. Uh, it's going to continue to be backward, and we're not going to be moving forward in terms of improving the quality of translation, um, you know, etc. So, yes, <clears throat> intuition is important. Yes, specialization is important. But when we talk about intuition, means you do not have 
you, you know, intuition means you have to be creative. You cannot translate literature without being creative. Because in literature, uh, literature has so many, you know, or literature is a metaphorical language. You have meta metaphors and similes and personifications. If, you know, if you, can, if you are going to translate this like word for word, whatever translation you're going to end up having, <clears throat> it's not going to make any sense. Even if it makes sense, it might not have the same impact, might not have the same effect, uh, what we call the communicative effect. Like you read the story, <clears throat> you read the story, you understand it, but you know, you say, oh, so what? But you, re you read it in a different kind of language, you say, wow, you know, yeah, I agree. All has to do, the meaning is the same, but all has to do with the style. All has to do with, with being creative in terms of selecting the terms. Selecting the selecting the terms and uh, using uh, or maybe focusing on the choice of words. In other words, so translation is an intuitive process. It it should be creative, and it should be uh, based on talent. You know, if you don't, if you're not talented, then specialization can help you improve your quality of translation. So the the argument that translation is only a, an intuition or you know, it, you know, you can do it or you cannot do it. It's just, this is false. It's not true. So now, if I ask you the question, would you say translation is an, is an intuition? You know, you, you know, if you are creative and you're talented, you can do translation. If you're not creative, if you're not talented, then you're not going to be a professional translator. I would say that is a, that is a fallacy. That's not true. We're not. We, you know, you're going to have both. You, are, you, you have those translators who are creative and talented. I agree. But you are those also who are creative and talented. They don't know how to translate. You know, translation is a science. It's, a, it's an art also. It requires, you know, knowledge of the skills, knowledge of the theory, and a lot of practice. Um, you know, yes, I agree that sometimes you have, you have those who recite poetry as if they haven't done, you know, even, even though they haven't even gone to school. Yes, but that is not the norm. This is an exception. So translation is an intuitive process. Is it, is it, do we need to be, do we need to focus, do we need to have, uh, you know, or maybe do we need to be creative and talented and that's it? Or should we, should we, with translation, or maybe specialization has a lot to do with it. We'll talk about the specialization in a second. So yes, creativity and talent both are extremely important in translation, but that is not, the whole story. Now, translation is specialization. Only medical doctors, add the S here, only medical doctors can translate medical articles. That is an argument. They say, well, if you're not a doctor, then you're not going to understand medical texts. No, I've been teaching medicine, medical articles and, and scientific and legal for the past 20 years. You know, I am not a doctor and I don't claim to be a doctor. But I understand medical articles because I have read so many, so much, and search, researched so much. Uh, and I'm probably, you know, I'm familiar with the terminology. I'm familiar with the language of the medicine or language of, or the medical language, just like I'm familiar with the legal language. I'm not a lawyer, okay? So if you want to be a medical translator, although you're not a medical doctor, you have to be equipped with excellent knowledge of medical terminology. You have to know, you know, a lot about medical issues. Like, for example, you need to read about Alzheimer. You need to read about, uh, let's say, uh, bypass surgery, uh, cardiology, uh, cardiovascular diseases, let's say amnesia, you know, all these kind of issues. I'm not saying you're going to finish it in one month or one year, but language in different contexts, language or the different, uh, sorry, the internet, connection is unstable hopefully now it's stable <laughs> so you can translate medical doc, medical articles although you're not a medical doctor but it requires knowledge of of, uh, of the medical field and as i said you're not gonna study just like a doctor but only focus on the language and the terminology used and you will be fine lawyers can translate legal documents that's not true yeah of course if we have a medical doctor who specialize in translation and the transition theory and had the expertise of doing medical translation, that would be an ideal translator because he knows his subject very well. The same thing applies to the lawyer. If a lawyer is 
somebody studied the law and experience, maybe practice, uh, you know, uh, you know, being a lawyer, let's say, or practice the law. Uh, then all of a sudden he changed into, um, or maybe he wanted to pursue translation to be a, uh, let's say, a professional legal translator. That will be an ideal situation. He will be perfect translator. Remember, assuming that he knows the skills and knows the theory and he has the experience, he will excel. It, will require, it, might, it may require less time from him to be a professional translator than somebody who hasn't really studied the law and he has started from zero. So this applies to medical translation, legal translation, and even scientific translation. So when we say translation is specialization, that's not true because translation is not only specialization. You need to be creative. You need to be talented. You need to be knowledgeable. You need to be skillful. So to me, when, I, when somebody asked, asked me to, you know, how would you define a translator? I said, translator is a good reader, a good articulator, a good uh, thinker, a good analyzer, uh, a good, uh, let's say, uh, linguist. So you could see in Europe in the 15th century, when a translator used to cross from one country to another, the immigration officers, you know, they used to bow, you know, bow down for him because he is almost like a holy man. This guy knows languages and other cultures and, and his role in life is extremely important for everybody. Uh, unfortunately, you don't see that here these days because you know um, there is so much ignorance when it comes to people thinking of translation that translation is, is nothing. There is something, there's nothing even cold. You know, I hear that kind of argument. There's nothing cold even translation. You know, call it comparative linguistics. Well, call it English, Arabic English. Not really. Uh, those who believe that this is, uh, this is their reality, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm inviting them to rethink again. So back to intuitions and specialization. So this is an ideal situation, uh, but difficult to find. If you, you know, to me, the best and the most idealistic kind of translation is somebody who is talented and, uh, and creative, but also he's specialized. You find them, this is an ideal situation, you find some, but it's not, it's not easy. You're not gonna find it you know, among all translators. Maybe less than a third of professional translators all over the world, you find them very intuitive and with, with, the, with, with a specialty. Uh, and that's why in the US, I don't know about uh, Europe, in the US now, you could be a professional translator in a specific kind of field. You can say, okay, I'm going to study the theory of, tra theory of translation and interpreting. I'm going to study languages, uh, uh, translation industry, terminology, computer applications, and all these kind of issues, you know, language cognitions also. But I want to focus on legal translation. So you try to focus on that particular area of translation. At the end of the day, you will be a legal translator. Same thing applies to medical translation. So, so specialization is very important. But also, you cannot really specialize and you don't know how to write. You don't know how to, to be creative when it comes to translating uh, literature. If you want to go into literature, by the way, you have to be talented when it comes to literature. You have to have a sense of appreciation of literature. You cannot really translate if you don't enjoy literature. So therefore, those who translate or focus or maybe specialize in literary translation, they don't do it for money. They don't do it so they can be they get a prestigious kind of position. They do it because they love literature. And for those who are listening to me now, if you do not like literature, if you don't enjoy literature, do not go into it. You can just learn translation in general, focus on a specific, maybe easy type of text, but don't go into literature because literature, if you don't enjoy it, you're not going to be able to succeed in translating it because it is very, you know, you have to be very creative in translating literature. Can you imagine translating an Arabic poem? Kallamatni wa lamma kallamatni kallamatni. Imagine if you translate this maintaining the form and the function. And even if you paraphrase this, it's not going to be effective as a source text. The same thing applies to Shakespeare's uh, sonnet. Let's say, shall I compare you to the summer's day? Okay, my mistress' eyes are nothing like the sun. You know, where... You know, think, think about what you're reading in literature and how, how can you be creative to the extent where you can really 
you know, render the meaning in the source text exactly in the same way, contextually and stylistically, the same way as in the, in the source language. It's not easy. You have to love this. You have to excel in this to be able to excel as an internet translator. Now, what do we do here? You know, let's go ahead and define what is a proper translation. You know, because, you know, I, I'm asked this, I've been asked this question so many times, you know, uh, doctor, how, how do you, how do you, how do we know this is good transition or not? Uh, or how do you assess our translation? Well, I read it, everything is fine. Well, you're right. Everything's fine. But, you know, there are issues of grammar. Maybe ideational content wise, it's not really accurate because, you know, you, there's, mistran there's mistranslation or there are mistranslations here and there. Contextually, it's not relevant. Semantically, you know, and pragmatically, you know, maybe they're, maybe, you know, they're not equivalent source and target. And phonologically, in, in terms of literature, and in terms of how languages, how language uh, is read and how, how language flows, you know, it's not really natural. So you could read a text, everything is fine, but it doesn't really flow. Phonologically, there's something funny about it when it comes to synonym couplets. You know, the thing words don't fit together. Or at the pragmatic and semantic level, there is a mismatch, you know. So to me, I created this kind of list, and you could use it if you like when you grade your uh, students, if you like. So to me, the best kind of translation, and when it is grammatically, when the text is grammatically correct, when, con when, when the content in the source text is conveyed accurately in the target language, and also context is being taken into account, otherwise you cannot translate the sources without understanding the context in which words in the source text are used. And semantically and pragmatically, they should be equivalent, which means the intention behind the meaning and the intention behind the source text should be re uh, rendered exactly in the same way. And the language flows nicely and reads as if it was written by a native speaker of English. Uh, I, hope, I hope this is clear. Now, translator skills. Now, in order to achieve this idealistic or ideal translation, or that proper or quality translation, you as a translator needs to, to have the following. You have to have excellent knowledge of the source language and the target language. And I would say, and I hope, you know, some of you might not really get upset at me because, you know, the problem with those coming from the Middle East that they know Arabic very well, but you know, their, 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 their level of understanding the English language is not. Some of them, they're excellent, but the majority of those you know, specializing in translation, you know, they think, well, I know a little bit of English, but he is perfect in Arabic. You can't do that. Yes, the United Nations now, you know, not, you know, over the past maybe 10, 15 years, they say, if you want to translate and work in the United Nations, you have to have at least three languages, not two. But also you will never translate from your mother tongue into the source language, into a target language, into your foreign language. You can't. You have to translate into your mother tongue because they know that you know your mother tongue is the best. I'll repeat, you know your mother tongue is the best, therefore they will, you are allowed to translate from English into Arabic. Because you, when you translate from English into Arabic, you are in control. But if you do not have the same knowledge in English, the same, the same knowledge you have about your own language, then you not control the target language or the target text. Therefore, you know, you translate the Arabic into English, but you're not sure 100% if the source, if the target language, if the target text actually expresses exactly the same meaning at all or various levels of meaning. So, I mean, who would have, you have to be bilingual. The best, to me, that is the best. If you are bilingual, which means you are raised, you know, uh, learning both languages together, that is perfect. You are a perfect translator because language comes to you without thinking about native language, or oh, this is my native language, or this is my, my foreign language. You don't. Uh, let's say kids born to mom and dad, but they speak different in both languages. Um, they are bilingual. Those are the best. Uh, they have excellent potentials for being excellent translators, you know, but you could learn the skills. You can learn the skill, you become professional and translator also, but it requires a lot of work. So you need to bring whatever language you are, you know, you think it's not up to 
uh, is not up to the level of the other language, you need to bring that language up to the level of, as I said, the other language. Assuming you're suffering, maybe you have difficulties or you have maybe, you do not have an excellent knowledge of the target language, then you need to work hard on it so you can bring it up to the source language. Or uh, let's say both of them are weak, then your quality of translation will suffer. Your quality of translation will suffer. So you could see, I mean, there's so much involved when it comes to translation. It's not about, you know, speaking English. It's not about, you know, speaking Arabic. It's not about knowing English and knowing Arabic. It's about analyzing profoundly what is actually expressed in the source language and in what way we can render this into the target language. So um, skills also, you need to know how to use monolingual and bilingual dictionaries. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know if I ask this question, like how many of you as translators, you know, you know, how many of you have all kind of dictionary? How many of you have only one dictionary? How, how many of you have only or have no dictionaries? You know, I have students come into class sometimes beginning first semester, let's say, they're just joining the program. You know, I, and I ask this question, they say, well, no, I don't, I've never thought of buying one. Well, I had one such and such. You can't do that. You have to, you have always to have an up-to-date monolingual and bilingual dictionary. Always, you know, and maybe a, you know, maybe a, you know, a set of maybe five or six or a number of five, six uh, dictionaries would be even more helpful. But also dictionaries help, yes, but also you need to know the tools like cat tools, you know, you need to know how to use machine translation, like Google translation. You need to use uh, also different apps like uh, Trados or Mimikyu and uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, what, all, all machine translation apps. It would be nice to use them. Sometimes, you know, you, know, you could get a, a, you know, a product of, of any kind of machine translation. Uh, it helps you to look at, you know, how, uh, how, the machine translated this kind of text, uh, but you do a lot of editing and sometimes if the, the translation is bad, it's better even to redo it from the beginning. And that's what I tell my students. Um, or machine translation, machine translations, by the way, or CAT tools uh, are used mainly for larger documents, the United Nation. It's not just to figure the, the, line, the structure and the content of the source text. They want to just get the gist of the meaning of that particular uh, document that could be 500 pages or maybe a thousand page. They don't know what, what it's talking about really or discussing. Uh, but it's not going to be a quality translation. It will never be. It, it, it's loaded with all kinds of errors and problems. But at least it gives you an idea. Otherwise, there is no way, you know, any machine translation can be really, uh, can be published without, you know, spending so much time uh, you know, spending so much time on it by a human translator. And as I said, uh, the, the, the process of editing a machine, translation, a machine translated text is more strenuous and more difficult than doing the transition from the beginning. Uh, knowledge and process. As I said, knowledge and knowledge means you know the facts about the tech, about you know you know the facts about you know something you're going to be translating about. Uh, let's say uh, you're going to be you're going to be translating a medical article. You know you know you know you know medical terms. You know how doctors write. Uh, you know about uh, medical issues. You know so you can say I'm very knowledgeable about you know medicine. Therefore I'm you know I'm a good translator. And I would say no, because you are actually familiar with the jargon, you are familiar with terminology, you are familiar with tools and computer uh, applications, and you are uh, actually you know, familiar with source language and target language. If you are familiar with those three, then you become a, medical, a good medical translator. Um, in other words, what gives you the process is knowing how to do the translation. You might have the knowledge, but you don't know how to do the translation. I'm a medical doctor, but I don't know how to translate. Then you have the knowledge, but you don't have the process. So the best kind of here, the best kind of um, translated, uh, translator is that uh, is the one who knows or who has the knowledge and also has the process. And the process here, under the process, comes the method, the approaches, the techniques, uh, because translation is a, 
uh, problem solving technique. You know, what, you know what I mean? So yes, knowledge is important, but knowledge alone is not enough. Process is important. Process alone is not enough. You need to have both knowledge and process. And when I say knowledge and process, I mean jargon and terminology of the text you're translating. You need to have tools and, 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 and apps so you can translate it in different languages if you like, or at least see you know, what comes out as a result of using an app or another. And you need to also be, an, you, know, you need to have good knowledge of the source language and the target language. Only through this, you will be able to, um, to do a good translation. So conclusion, this kind of knowledge is key, but not enough. So we're talking about knowledge here. If you look at the second slide, here we have a process. Then we're talking process. So a process here involves methods, techniques, strategies, and approaches. And as, as I said earlier, translation requires both knowledge, which means terminology, uh, field jargon, and, uh, and uh, tools and computer applications, and source and target language knowledge. That is required. That is key. When you know this, you still need to know the methods of transferring you know, from one language to another, or the techniques of transferring a, a, an ST into a TT, or the strategies of resol resolving problems you, know, you, you encountered in, in translating X into Y. And, uh, and, and the approaches, what kind of approaches? Are you gonna be talking about the semantic approach or maybe a communicative approach or could be foreignizing versus domestication? Is it, is it, let's say, the literal, the word for word? We'll talk about this in a second. I'm trying to hurry up a little bit. Yeah, so we can cover everything uh, on time. Now, since now, this is, this is an introduction, by the way, sorry. This is an introduction about what is translation, what translation, what translation, what, is the, what translation involves, and, you know, uh, what should we know, you know, when it comes to, the skill, what you know about translation and what are the requirements for doing professional translators, like translators' skills and qualifications. Now, we will be talking about translation techniques. And as I said, techniques could be methods here. It could be, you know, uh, ways. It could be procedures, whatever you call it. Unfortunately, even until now, after maybe 40 years of um, of let's say, of publications on translation, we still, I haven't really seen an article or maybe a book, like a paper, where it really defines translation, uh, but also it, uh, it differentiates between a, a technique and a method and a, an approach and a, and, a, and strategy. Unfortunately, you know, um, we are, as, a, as trans translation professionals, we are in turmoil when it comes to terminology, unfortunately. So when it comes to translating a text, a translator has these choices. You have choices, word for word translation, literal or direct translation, uh, free translation, word for word translation. I'm sorry, there's no need for this one. It's been uh, deleted, okay. And we have faithful translation. I might have added later on different uh, choices, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk, let's talk about this one by one and will tell you exactly when do you use word for word translation? When do you use literal versus direct translation? When do you use free translation? What does unfaithful translation and what does each one of those strategies, what does it mean? Now, word for word translation. In word for word translation, the source language word is translated into another language word by their most common meaning, which can also be out of context at times, especially in idioms and proverbs. She's a peach. She is as sweet as helpful. You know, you know this is a translation of idioms. You know, these are examples, you, know, you, can, you can think about them. He is full of beans. What does that mean idiomatically? He has lots of energy. Can you imagine translating these word for word translation? She is, she is a peach. Can you translate this word for word? That's impossible, you know? Peach, chokh, aw durraq, innaha durraq. It doesn't make sense. So again, based on the meaning, she is sweet as helpful. This is what you need to, you need to say in your translation. So all these 
you know, proverbs and idioms, it will be impossible to do word for word translation. So what do you do? You do free translation. You focus on the meaning, not structure. You focus on the meaning and structure. The first one, you know, sorry, the, the meaning of the, if you say that she is a peach or he's full of beans, or it is not my cup of tea, you know, all these, if they are translated word for word, the transition will be nonsical, non nonsical, nonsensical, I'm sorry. It will be nonsensical. It doesn't make any sense, you know? So you have to do the free translation where you focus on the meaning and you end up having she's uh, for she is a peach means, you know, she is sweet and helpful. Uh, he, she, he is full of beans. It means he has lots of energy. It's not my cup of tea means I don't care for that or about this anymore. Or he is full of, uh, of baloney. He doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, it is just sour grapes. You know, they have resentment. It is just sour grapes, you know, hatred. You know, when you say he is sour, means he doesn't like people. He just doesn't laugh and, and he's not happy. You know, he's, he's grumpy all the time, you know. So in word for word translation, it is impossible to, to use, to translate idiomatic language. Okay. You focus, you know, we'll talk about this in a second. In literal translation, literal translation is possibly only when there are two parallel structures in both the source language and the target language. When we say John went to the library. As an example, if you look at this structurally, we have John noun and went verb to the library prepositional phrase or to preposition the library is a, is, a, is a noun phrase. It's a noun, right? So if you, if you translate this literally, it might work, but not, not word for word. Not, if you say word for word, it might work also. So you could see, uh, when language is used straightforward, not idiomatically, like metaphors and idioms and, and similes and such and such, when language is used straightforward and short, like at the sentence maybe level or at the phrase level, you could do literal translation, you could do word for word translation. But again, you have to pay attention to the word order in Arabic. In Jamila, beautiful garden. In Arabic, it is garden beautiful, you know. You know, yes, you're using word for word, no, word, word, word translation, word for word translation, but pay attention to the word order because the adjective preceding the noun or, you know, or noun preceding the adjective or coming after the noun in Arabic. This uh, means beautiful, garden. The adjective comes before the noun. In English, a uh, noun comes, no, in English, a noun comes, before, uh, adjective comes before the noun and the other, it's the other way around in Arabic. Uh, but word order is always a problem in, when it comes to translating Arabic into English or English into Arabic. Uh, <clears throat> so here we have John went to the loo. So we can say it in Arabic, ذهب <clears throat> John إلى المكتبة. So you could say John ذهب went uh, went ذهب John John went ذهب to إلى المكتبة. So that is literal translation. That's word translation. But if you go back to this, <clears throat> you can't do literal translation. It doesn't work. Okay? So when, when you're asked, <clears throat> can we use this translation? Well, yes, you can, but it depends on the text. Can we use word for word translation? Yes, you can, but it depends on the text. Generally speaking, you cannot use literal translation for larger documents um, uh, where you have winding sentences, long sentences, and you have language uh, in idiomatic kind of forms. And you can't. I'll show you this in an example. But before I do so, so when we talk about direct translation, you have one equals another in the target language. One word in the source language equals another in the target language. That is called direct translation, according to Vinnie and Durbanet. That's one of the strategies. And literal, many translation scholars talked about literal translation. So this is literal translation. When the, the two, the source language and the target language, they have parallel structure, the similar structure similar. So here, Arabic and English, and maybe probably other languages, they have similar or similar parallel structures. Now, let's, let's, let's go back here. Or let's go forward, sorry. Literal translation is possible only where there are two parallel concepts. Also, if you have two concepts in Arabic, between Arabic and English, like beauty, 
is be- the concept of beauty in Arabic exactly the same concept of beauty in English, then you could do literal translation. What about democracy? The concept of democracy, the concept of happiness. You know, are these terms here or words, do they have exactly the same structures in Arabic as in English or in English as in Arabic? If this is the case, then you could do literal translation. Okay? Now, you have faithful translation, which means you have to adhere to the source text in terms of content and style and structure. You know, that is hard to achieve. In faithful translation, the translator interprets the exact, the exact contextual meaning of the original without the constraints of the grammatical structure of the target language. What does that mean? It means, you know, you need to study language exactly in the same way that is used contextually in the source language without paying attention or without really, uh, you know, without having any, you know, any limitation as to what kind of grammatical structure is used in the target language, which means you might alter some of the structures in the target language to fit the meaning in the source language. I'll repeat. You focus on the meaning expressed in the source language, but sometimes when you convey that kind of meaning into the target language, you should not have any constraints of grammar or grammatical structures in the target language. Or sometimes you could even be lenient when it comes to using the grammatical, uh, you, know, uh, you know, grammatical structures in the target language, but it can also be in the source language. So, you know, here requires the, the faithful translation, although you are adhering to the source language text in terms of content and form, but, you know, but, you know, you know, you, you're more likely, you know, you're more likely, to, you know, you're more likely to be lenient or more flexible when you're translating the source language or the target language. Maybe you change nouns into verbs or maybe, uh, you know, verbs are deleted, although the meaning is still there. You see what I mean? So when we say within the constraints of the, within the limitation of the grammatical structure of the target language. Within, you're not going to be copying one and one, one to one. It's not one to one correspondence here. So a little bit of freedom, but still you are adhering to the source language text and function. Semantic translation. Uh, Semantic translation is a type of translation that takes into account the aesthetic value of the source text. That is geared towards literature because literature has an aesthetic value. Meaning, sound has meaning. You know, rhyming, rhyme and meter, they, they have meaning. You cannot really do away with Adam in literature. And if you do, you are actually distorting the, uh, the literary text. So uh, it's an aesthetic. You know, many times you read, many times you read a, a translation, you don't enjoy it because the aesthetic value is lost. And, and that is a problem of, of many of us sometimes when we translate the source text into the target text. We, we produce... Um, you know, a text that is really, that reads like English, but there is a, there is that kind of, uh, uh, let's say, poetic language that's lost in literature, like translating poems. Think about it. Translate a poem into English, you know, you lose the aesthetic value of English. Any poem in Arabic, unless you are professional, unless you are enjoying, you know, enjoying the, what do you call, the reading of literature, you have a sense of appreciation when it comes to literature. And, you know, you've been composing poetry and you really enjoy doing so. And if you do so, you will maintain the aesthetic value of the source text, the literary text. But if you're not, you'll try. But you need to try so many times, at least to make sure that whatever you're translating, that poem you translated, it makes sense. And at least, hopefully, you will be able to maintain the aesthetic value. Adaptation. That's another, st- another technique. Adaptation is used mainly for plays, again in literature, and poems. It refers to that type of translation where the text is rewritten, taking into account the source language culture rendered into the target language culture. In this type of translation, characters, themes, plots are usually preserved. So adaptation. I don't know how many of you uh, watch and let's say or read a story in English, but it was really acted out in Arabic films. You know, sometimes you can change the, the characters of 
the characters in a, in a source language text, you change them into different characters in the uh, target language. So the audience might enjoy reading and hearing these kind of names or characters or you know, better. Like for example, John, you change John into Ahmed. You're adapt, you are here, uh, you know, you're adapting, you're adapting Ahmed for John in the source text. Ahmed is a target language. That is possible. Sometimes, you know, you see uh, short stories or novels or maybe plays. They're using, you know, the same kind of character as in the source text. They're just moving John into John in the target. You know, while it foreignizes the text, you know, they're still acceptable as a strategy. Because according to Vinay and according to uh, Venuti in Foreignizing and Domestication, that is a, that's a book he published. I like it so much. You know, I would give it a try and, and read it. Um, you know, sometimes it's all up to you. Do you want to foreignize the text, which means it sounds to the native speaker or it sounds to the, to the target reader, it sounds foreign, but you would like to maintain some cultural elements in uh, the target language. So they know more about the culture of the source text. Um, they might struggle a little bit understanding certain things. They might do some kind of research, understanding some of the terms you use in the target language. But that's a strategy. But also you can domesticate the text, which means you want to translate a novel into a novel where you do adaptation in terms of themes and plots, characters. You preserve them in the source language. You know, you, you take them from the source language and, and re-enlist them into the target language. You know, and in that sense, you know, you know, you're, uh, no, if you do so, you are foreignizing the text. But if you want to replace, adapt characters from, you know, in the target language, different from the source language, then here you are domesticating the text. Let me rephrase it because I probably messed up here a little bit. Uh, you change characters from the source language into characters that are suitable in the target language. Uh, you're changing George into Ahmed in the target language. Uh, Khadija into... Uh, let's say uh, Khadija, if you want to, if you, if you translate from English into Arabic, then Khadija, from Arabic into English, then Khadija becomes Jane in English. So what I mean? It, it works both ways. So that's one way. Here, you know, you're foreignizing. You're introducing foreign element in, the, in your translation. If you don't want to do that, you know, then you could domesticate, which means whoever's going to be reading your translation Will, will feel as if this text is not translated from a different language. Everything is uh, clear, familiar, you know, terminology, characters, novel, you know, everything is preserved as if it was written in the target language. Uh, it's up to you, you know, I think you, uh, both are valid argument. Uh, for me, when I want to translate a novel, I like to translate, I like to domesticate the novel. I like to write a novel, although I would say this novel is based on, on, on the source text such and such. I like to introduce, you know, I like to change the characters, you know, that would uh, fit the target uh, audience. I like to, you know, even places, unless the whole novel is about a, a description of a place and known to both source target readers and, and source target, a uh, source language readers and target language readers. If, if the term or the character, you know, if the term or the character uh, is uh, shared among both cultures, then you can keep it. It's not a big deal. Really. Adaptation. Uh, free translation, that's my best uh, method of translation. It is uh, only used when the source and the target language are not structurally possible or similar. So you could be, you could say, safely say that 80, if not 90% of most languages, they are different from one another. So, you know, I would say, I would, I would be safe to say, if you want to do free translation, you will be 80% 80, 80 of the times that you, you will be doing a good translation based on your, your skills and experience, as I said. Uh, for example, there was a cat. How can you translate this uh, uh, then? Facebook, Twitters, among other terms. How can you, you zakah is not charity. So what you do here, you have to explain. You have to feel freely about the meaning of zakah and have to explain it. Come up with something maybe that is closely or you know, closely enough to the meaning of zakah. 
um, adhan. It's not a call. Well, it is a call, but it's a different kind of meaning. So more likely here, you're, maybe, you are, uh, you know, maybe you are adapting or borrowing these kind of terms into the English language or using them in the target language. Facebook, I mean, I don't know. Those terms are borrowed, you know. But the, if you want to translate them, you have to, you have to translate them freely, uh, which means you focus on the meaning. So the above words may have different meanings, no equivalent or strange equivalent. So zakah, maybe the closest to, to uh, the closest term in English to the word zakah in Arabic is charity, but not enough. So you need to translate freely what it means and paraphrase it. And then, same thing, Facebook, Twitter, but facts, let's say, facts, it's a, it's a borrowed term, but, it, you know, but it's been Arabicized or Arabized. Uh, the same thing for telegraph or maybe internet, Shabak uh, al So pay attention. When can you use free translation? When can you not use for free translation? Free translation means your translation is based on the meaning, not structure. And it can only be done when the source language and the target language are completely different. No common ground and make a conclusion. Um, idiomatic translation. Idiomatic translation involves translating the message of the original text. Translating the message of the original text. However, idiomatic translation has a tendency sometimes to distort the original meaning by using colloquial and idiomatic expressions. You know, and I keep telling uh, students, you know, sometimes pay attention to idioms and synonym couplets, because if you want to, if you want to translate idiomatically, you end up having a language in English that is not 100% natural. So you're focusing, yes, on the message, but you're not paying attention to the idiomatic, the meaning of the idiomatic structures, idiomatic expressions. And, and that is, that is really an issue. Uh, communicative translation, where the focus here is on the effect of the translation. In communicative translation, the exact contextual meaning, contextual meaning, underline this please, of the original text is displayed in a manner where both content and language structure are easily acceptable and comprehensible or comprehensible uh, to the readers. So, um, to me, Remember, I, at the beginning, I said a joke has to be translated as a joke because the effect of the joke, you know, is laughing. If you want to translate a text that has an effect on the reader and the effect requires an action or a reaction, then it has to be very clear. So the communicative translation is that which, focus, which focuses on the effect of your translation on the target reader. The effect the effect of the target, the, the target text on the target reader. So uh, it's not semantic. Semantic is based on meaning, but communicative effect, uh, communicative translation is based, is based on what? On the effect the transition has on the target reader. Um, so, you, you know, there are, might be issues if you want to do, if you want to translate it dramatically. Um, so the, the communicative effect might be a little bit lost. Uh, and other methods of translation you have borrowing, and paraphrasing, borrowing and paraphrasing. Borrowing, let's talk about borrowing. Borrowing is the process by which a word from one language is borrowed for use from another. The word borrowed is called a loan word. Uh, for example, as I said, fax, it's borrowed from English. Uh, let's say internet, computer, borrowed from English. Although, unfortunately, it, it, you know, these words, are, um, it, you know, have been Arabicized lately when the, the English terms already been used in the, uh, like in the public. And it's going to be very hard now to force the, the, the Arabicized word into, uh, force it into the market, into the, into the street, you know. Um, even when you read it now, like Alat al-Hasub or Alat al Oh, for example, uh, let's say Shabakat al Ankabutiya, you feel funny reading it in Arabic text because, because the, the, the English 
borrowed terms already been used and, and that's it. And there's nothing wrong with borrowed terms from English into Arabic or vice versa if, if things make uh, sense. Borrowing can be used when there is no equivalent or equivalence in the target language. As I said, fax, computer, falafel, for example, it's used here in the U.S. as falafel. Chips, you know, baglava, and among other cultural terms. Those are borrowed terms. And uh, paraphrasing, paraphrasing uh, may not be recognized as a strategy, technique, but you know, a lot of, you know, many translators use a paraphrase to explain a, a term that's not, not existing in the target language. But to me, it is a technique. Paraphrasing is used only when there is, where there is no equivalent in the target language. Uh, the same examples I, I uh, listed earlier, like, for example, Shahama. What is Shahama? I cannot imagine you're going to find exactly the same term in, in English. Like Afifa. What does that mean? Like a, uh, like a, a girl with chastity, let's say with chess and like a, uh, I don't know. I mean, if, if the same implications between Afifa and Arabic and uh, get with chastity in English, I don't think the implications are the same. I don't think the connotations are the same, you know? So you know, to me, I would paraphrase maybe uh, more to explain the meaning of Shahama and the meaning of Afifa. Paraphrasing also is not preferred in translation, in translation because explaining a word or a phrase distorts the text characteristics. I keep telling students, you know, if you want to do, if you have a, 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 a culturally and a heavy loaded text, let's say, if you want to have 500 footnotes at the end of the text, then you're more likely just paraphrase the whole text. There's no need for the translation because, you know, too many, too many footnotes and too many paraphrases, uh, you know, more likely, uh, is, you know, for the target reader, it's not really enjoyable to read the text. So, Maybe one footnote, two, two paraphrases, that's fine. But if you have more, then more likely the functional text will be different. Um, I think uh, the, the translation you know, will be monotonous and, and it's not going to be of quality. Um, and uh, that's it for now. I, uh, I hope uh, that was uh, helpful. And please, uh, if you have any comments or questions on, on uh, these slides, I'll be uh, more than happy to respond uh, to any of the comments and any of the inquiries you have. I, uh, once again, I would like to thank you all for being uh, here on, uh, um, on uh, whatever uh, app you, you, you've been using. And uh, you know, I enjoy uh, really talking about this, although uh, I, I could have had a, a, a break really. Uh, talking for maybe an hour and 40 minutes, not easy. Uh, but uh, let me again, thank you very much. Thank, uh, I thank you. I thank also the University of King Khalid University uh, for making this uh, a success. And I thank all those who attended this workshop. And I uh, look forward to receiving some of your comments and maybe inquiries about the translation technique. Thank you. God bless you. And uh, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Shayab. We still have time for questions. Uh, uh, if I can hear you, I, I, I really yeah, faintly yeah. hear you. But uh, I'll, I'll do my best. Please, go ahead. Okay. Uh, Abdul Rahman, can you uh, uh, handle the mic to Dr. Abdullah Al-Milhi? Abdul Rahman, the host, can you uh, unmute Dr. Abdullah Al-Milhi? So he will uh, run the... Q and A session. Oh, Riyab, Riyab, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm. I'm here. Yes, I'm here. Uh, yes, I'm here. Okay. Hello. Yes, yes, we can hear you loud. Uh, the, there is a, also we have the chat. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. There is a chat on on the screen. If you can see it. You mean cat tools? No, no, chat tools there. And some of our colleagues maybe present their questions there. Okay. Maybe we can handle the mic uh, to Dr. Abdullah. You mean there, there's a question on cat tools? Yes. Okay. If you, if you click it. Uh, 
Translation, thank you. There's a thank you. Thank you, Professor Really, we appreciate it. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, the translation could be phonologically sound. Could you also elaborate on this? There is a question from uh, Dr. Abdul Wahid Zumar. Uh, the question is said, uh, Go translation should be phonologically sound. Could you elaborate on this? Yes. 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 Um, when I say phonologically, it has to do with sound. You know, phon sound means uh, acceptable. Sound does not mean sound, the voice. So when I say that any translation has to be natural. And when I say natural means when you read the, tra the translated text, it, it should sound like a text you read in English. Um, for example, in literature, you read a story, you know, a short story, you translate a short story in, in, from Arabic into English, you read the translation, it doesn't sound, you know, English, uh, because, you know, the synonym couplets, like words do not fit together. Uh, instead of saying, for example, Ahmed was, uh, let's say, you could say Ahmed was pretty, now, pretty, you cannot use pretty for, the, for a boy. That doesn't sound really English. Uh, if you say, um, you know, a handsome woman, well, handsome doesn't fit with woman. So that doesn't sound English. So any, the, the best kind of translation is that which actually maintains naturalness. When you read the translation, it has to sound natural. So when I say phonologically, it has to do with how you read the language. But also when it comes to literature, you know, um, let's say, you know, rhyme and, and, and rhyme and intonation, uh, rhyme and intonation, you know, it's just like a question, uh, a question asked, it, you know, it has to be translated as a, as a question, or a statement it has to be translated as a statement, you know, so all, all, all these kind of examples have to do with, you know, whether, you know, you are, at, you are using a language that sounds uh, natural to the, to the native speaker of English, and even the choice of words you use, you know, they perfectly fit with one another. What we call Many times we, we as translators, when we translate Arabic into English, we make uh, wrong choices in terms of using synonym couplets, you know. Uh, but in English, when, when you read the English text, you know, those synonym couplets you translate from Arabic into English, they don't make sense. Like we say, fish and chips, you know, how would you translate this into English? Okay, that doesn't sound, it doesn't sound even mean, meaning, meaningful, although uh, structurally is correct, but nobody's going to understand what you mean by um, fish and chips, okay? But for example, zayt and zahta, you know, those two, you know, those synonym couplets, they fit together. Sometimes, this, you know, couplets can be contrasting couplets also, like al-hayatu wal maut. You know, but if you say al-hayatu wa ta'am, it doesn't fit. No, pay attention to the, tra the target text. Like, it has to sound natural to those who read it. And mainly I'm talking about, you know, those target readers you are actually translating for. Thank you. I hope I did answer the question. Good. Uh, another question from uh, Sarah al -Atik. She said, yes. what, is, what is the name of your book? in which you uh, included a chapter about falsity, uh, falsity between two brackets, the issue of translation as an in a intuitive process. Well, actually, I have the latest book. It's called The Translation, Colon, uh, uh, Concepts and, and Terms, I think. But the, the book I was referring to is called, <laughs> excuse me, A Textbook of Translation. Uh, theoretical and practical implications. That was published in 19, in 2006. Uh, but, you know, I think if you, uh, you ask Sarah to go online and put my name, or she, she can write a textbook of translation, and then uh, put my name, S-A-I-D, and then she, yeah, S-H-I-Y-A-B, and she will get the, the book, because I have five or six books, um, um, I just want to make sure she, get, she gets the right one. Good. Another question is from Abdul Rahman. Uh, sorry, we would like to handle the mic to the dean, but we lost the contact with Riyadh. But we have uh, Abdul Rahman. Uh, Abdul Rahman, can you handle uh, Dr. Abdullah Milhi the mic? 
Anyway, another question from Abdul Rahman. Yes. Uh, so he said, uh, still we need to talk about strategies of translation. Maybe he means a summary of several uh, strategies that are used for translation. Uh, I'm not sure I understood the question. Do you uh, want me to talk about strategies of translation? Yeah, I think so. That's what he means. Is that is that what you mean? I, I don't know. That I think what this is what he means. <laughs> yeah, because all I have talked, you know, for the past maybe hour and forty minutes, it's just about strategies of translation. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yes. Yes. But if there's a specific kind of strategy, I'll be more than happy to elaborate on it. Okay, good. Another question from Mahmoud al -Hab. Uh, does it remain faithful translation when we change names in translation through adaptation? Uh, read that again, please. Uh, does it remain a faithful translation when we change names in translation through adaptation? No. No, a faithful translation, you are actually faithful to the, to the content, uh, to the message. You are actually faithful to the message and the form of the language. Good. It's not about you know maintaining characters, you know in, in you know use in the source language. You're maintaining them in the target language. Adaptation means only. It's, remember, as, as I said, adaptation means that when you translate literature, what would you do with names and characters in in in, uh, in the source language? Do you keep them as they are and you know render them into the target language, or you adapt the names? Let's say, give you an example. Uh, uh, J, you know, J. Arbery, you know, he, you know, one of the best translators, British translator, he translated the, uh, you know, One Thousand and One Night, right? Uh, Alf Layla Layla. Now he, uh, Arbery took so many many of the themes in Alf Layla Layla, and he he built on them a whole novel like Aladdin. If you compare Aladdin in the source text. With Aladdin in English, you'll find a lot of variation. But he adapted the theme, adapted maybe the, the characters. Although he wasn't really faithful, he was not faithful to the source text. I don't know, if, because, you know, there are, there are you know, uh, different opinions as, you know, whether the source text of Alf Layla Layla is Arabic or Chinese or Persian or God knows what. So we don't know exactly because there are so many different versions. So adaptation mainly has to do with the literature. If you're translating a novel, would you like to adapt the characters and the theme from the source language to the target language? But you, ha you know, uh, you could be faithful to the message and to the characters and to the uh, to the theme and the plot. And in that sense, you know, you are faithful in your translation. But if you don't, if you want to adapt, you're not going to be faithful to uh, to to the source language. It could be that you were faithful to the source language structure and uh, content, but not to the characters and to the theme and to the plot, uh, etc. Good. Uh, the other I hope this is clear. If you want me to clarify more, please let me know. I, I hope it's clear. Uh, <laughs> it comes from a, uh, just one comment I would like to, before I move to the next question. Yes. Uh, this, this room is uh, to the audience. This is a, uh, we can just accept 100 and we reach the maximum, 100 within the first 30 minutes. So others who would like to join uh, the system block them. We could not join. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Hamami, I, I, didn't I, I couldn't hear you. I'm, I'm talking about, uh, about the participants in this, uh, in this uh, webinar. How many, how many participants were there? Uh, 100, and that was the maximum. Wow, I didn't know that really. I felt here like there was nobody on the other end. <laughs> <laughs> And inshallah, next time uh, uh, we will try to solve this with e-learning because uh, there were more people to participate, uh, would like to participate. I received many text messages from our colleagues they want to join, but the system blocked them because the room only for 100 participants. Well, that is wonderful, uh, wonderful to hear, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Al-Hamami. And I, I, would, I would like to suggest, if you don't mind, like, and honestly, yes. now I'm struggling trying to hear the kind of the kind of, the kind of questions, and I I don't know what's going on. Is it is it with the, is it like on my end or at my end here, or is it at your end? I don't know really. Um, I'm 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 hardly I'm trying hardly to listen and trying to understand the question. 
Now, I, I uh, you know, suggest in the future, maybe before you, before you meet or before we have the, uh, the launching of the, the workshop, it would be nice to have maybe uh, to training maybe to work with the, with the whoever is going to be working with another workshop at least a day before to make sure that everything works fine. That's that we should do. Thank you for this note. Thank you. Uh, another question from uh, Asa Albishi. Uh, she said, "If you would, uh, if you would recommend any book to teach basic techniques in translating." Uh, in teach what? Teach what? Uh, basics techniques. Oh, basic techniques. Yes, from English to French. Well, I see. Uh, you know, I, I hate to sell my own stuff, really, because when I was published a book, a textbook of translation, I had Middle Eastern students in my mind. Although the examples were used in Arabic, but they were translated to English. Uh, now, most of the books published in the Western world, they they use examples from French and English and Spanish and sometimes you know, all kinds of languages. Unfortunately, they don't use examples from Arabic. So when somebody overseas, particularly in the Middle East, when they want to read, a, uh, let's say, read something about maybe, uh, let's say, uh, literal translation, you know, they, you know they, there is an explanation of what literal translation is all about. But, the, you know, they want an example. The example sometimes is, is excellent. At least it makes, you know, it makes a student aware exactly you know, what, what is it that, you know, we're talking about when it comes to literal translation? Uh, but the example, examples are in French or maybe, as I said, in German, you know, so the student gets lost. Now, in, in, in that book Sarah was asking about, and, uh, and I think it's, the book is still used by, uh, by uh, the Department of Translation I created 14 years ago at the, at the, the UAE University, uh, a textbook of translation. There are uh, chapters, you know, you know, on, you know, transition terminology, which means when we say pragmatic, semantics, uh, informative, um, informativity, equivalence, you know, literal translation, uh, sense translation, free translation, all these kind of, uh, all these terminologies, they are in a chapter in that book. But also I talk about fallacies of translation, like seven fallacies. I talked about methods of translation. And mainly I was focusing there on the word for word, literal and the free and I include even sense translation and what elegant translation, all kind of trans all transition methods. Uh, plus, the only book, you know, that is written with two chapters on legal and scientific translation. So I would recommend to the uh, uh, to the gentleman who asked that this is, uh, you know, this is a, an easy read uh, book and it's helpful if you want to teach it. Uh, it would be nice to focus, you know, on the terminology there and it will introduce at least students who are maybe first year or second year students of translation. Uh, of course, you know, some of the chapters, you know, they, they need help, you know, from the teacher, you know, because, you know, there are certain concepts I'm, I'm introducing in the book that it, it needs maybe expertise when it comes to translation. Okay. Now, if you, if, the, if you don't like this book, uh, I enjoy, uh, uh, you know, but again, we have, if you, if you look at Venuti, Venuti, maybe 1995, and the latest, maybe 2005 or four, it's called Foreignizing and Domestication. Uh, you, can, uh, you can look at another book by Jeremy Monday, Introducing Translation Studies. But as I said, with all honesty, and I, and I hope you, know, you, uh, you look at these uh, books, more, more likely you'll find them more advanced, and the students reading uh, these kind of chapters in these kind of books, they get lost because you know, they're geared towards graduate students, not undergraduate students. And uh, let uh, Dr. Hamami, let uh, this uh, gentleman write to me. I'll be more happy, more happy to send him even more information about, uh, you know, other books. Great. Uh, another, we have more, 10 more minutes. Uh, another question from Abdullah. Uh, he said, is the difference between technique, method, uh, approach a matter of level macro or to macro is, is Schemata, that you mean? <laughs> he said is the difference is the difference no in no see that that is my that is a problem i i did explain that in one of the slides i said you know when i when i was asked to do some kind of a workshop on translation i, I thought approach approaches to translation but honestly in the field 
there is a there is a, some kind of confusion when it comes to terminology, because you know what is an approach to translation? You know, even when you say theory of transition, there there is no theory of transition. There are theories of transition. There are approaches to translation. There are techniques and procedures. All these, to me, they're the same. But as you, I don't know if you mentioned this, but when we talk about approaches, is a is a method more than a strategy. A strategy is something to solve a problem, a transition problem with. Like you look at the text and there's an issue of translation here. You cannot really translate it. You could use a method. You could use a, a, an approach. You know, a strategy is a way of solving a problem. But, but a technique, uh, a method, uh, an approach, I think to me they're all the same. Okay. Uh, there are many, many questions. Uh, uh, the next question is from uh, Muhammad Mehsin. Uh, he said, excuse, uh, you said that machine translation yes. or CAT could create problem for human translators. Uh, his question is how can CAT tools be helpful for, uh, to translator or how can translators uh, utilize uh, this uh, technology? Well, first of all, if I understand the question correctly, I, uh, his name is Muhammad, you said? Yes, Muhammad. Just, uh, you know, tell Muhammad, he doesn't have to worry about this. You he know, can hear you machine, on, on the room. He's, sorry? Uh, he can hear you. Uh, yeah, machine he, translation is not, is not a threat to human translator. That would never, be, never happen. Because there's no way it, that machine question, translation will, it will end up in maybe 10, 50, 50 years from now doing translation just like a human translator. That's impossible. So the human translator is here to stay. Now, when it comes to uh, CAT tools, uh, CAT tools are helpful tools, by the way. Now, I ask my own students to use Google Translation because if you compare now Google Translation with Google Translations 50 years ago, there's a big improvement it, you know, in terms of accuracy. But it's not final. It's not final. Whatever you do, uh, through Google Translation, it requires you to go over the text, change so much of its structure, language, and grammar. Okay. But at least it's, it's, it's helping you. And if you have a document of 50 pages, if you want to go line by line or paragraph by paragraph, it might take you such and such. But if you have a good machine, you know, there are softwares like creating terminology. They help a lot of students, you know, you know, instead of going one by one and listing, all you have to do is just put the text through the app and it will give you a whole list of terminology. That is helpful. So machine translation or CAT tools, and when I say CAT means computer assisted translation, any translation you do, it's helping, you know, it's, it's, been, uh, it's, been, it's been done through the help of the computer on the tools. You know, it has improved a lot. And I don't want, and I hope all those who are listening to me, I do want them to think that if you use Google translation, oh my God, that's shame on you. Yes, it is shame on you if you use Google Translation and you submit it as if it's a final product. That's not going to work. But use it for complicated text and you start from that as a draft and you end up doing, you know, uh, the translation. You'll have an idea of the translation and you might even do it faster a little bit. Another question uh, from, uh, I think, Sarah. She asked us, uh, here when in, in King High University, we teach uh, translation courses in undergraduate. And her question is, what language should we focus? Uh, translating from Arabic to English or from English to Arabic in order to help a student? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Dr. Hamami, I, 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 I lost you. Uh, her, her question is that for undergraduate here in Saudi Arabia. Yes. Should, uh, in translation courses, should yes. the teachers uh, uh, focus more in translating uh, text from Arabic to English or from Arabic or from English to Arabic? Okay, that's a good question, you know, because when I started the program, the graduate program, I'm running now all the graduate programs, like six languages, including Arabic. I'm directing the Arabic plus the other six languages, like uh, uh, French and, and German and Spanish and Russian and Chinese, plus the PhD program in Translation Studies. You know, in most of the program, they focus from the from the foreign from the target from the mother tongue language into the foreign language which means in Saudi Arabia and probably this is common among all Middle Eastern countries universities they both they are they have a unidirectional they have a bi-directional method 
which means you translate from Arabic into English and English into Arabic. To me, what is needed in, uh, in, in, in most Middle Eastern institutions, that they need to focus on English more than on Arabic. Why? Because we know our language and we, we could easily find a way we can translate English into Arabic. But the majority of those who graduate from undergraduate program, they cannot translate from Arabic into English. So they are weaker from Arabic into English, but they are okay or good from English into Arabic. So if she wants my advice, I would focus more. I will introduce both, but I will focus more on translation from Arabic into English. And remember, Dr. Hamami, yes. even teachers sometimes find it difficult because they're not up to the level where, where, they, where they can really judge the translation of uh, Arabic into English. So that is serious. That's a serious issue. Thank you. And this is the last question. This is from me. This is kind of a but did you, uh, debatable questions that we have here. Uh, here. Uh, teachers, uh, uh, what is preferred to uh, ask students to have in translation classes? To have electronic dictionary or to have paper dictionary based on your experience? What is better for them to learn translation and to be better translators uh, uh, when we use a paper dictionary or electronic dictionary? Yes, uh, I, I don't know. I think, you know, I, I, uh, I've been in the U.S. for almost 27 years and I, and I, I now, right now, I don't see students using paper dictionaries at all. At all? So paper dictionaries are disappearing, uh, with all honesty. Mm. Because, you know, it takes time to to look up the, you know, the word and flip pages and, and, and then go back and read this back and forth. And whereas when, if now you, you know, most of students, they work on machines, on the computers. And it, it, it's a matter of just like going into a different, not going into a different, just like maybe clicking on a link and it will have the whole dictionary in front of you. And you just put the first letter, like G, for example, for girl, you know, and it will give you all the, all the entries. It is faster to use electronic dictionaries, but they have to be up to date. But here's also my advice to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the sister who really asked the question. You know, during the first year. This is my, this is my be, question. Huh? This is my question. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, yes. Uh, so, I mean, I, I, my advice to, you know, to you, Dr. Hamami, and to those who are listening, if they're interested in, 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 in uh, in hearing the question, the answer to the question is that you need to focus on using the dictionary only during the first and the second year of the undergraduate uh, degree. And after that, students have to be able to read the text and understand the meaning from the context in which the word is used. Because, you know, that is the issue I have with students coming from overseas. You know, that, that they do not have, they do not have a, their own mental dictionary. The first year and the second, they have to develop their own mental dictionary. That is a huge advantage. And, and the second year, they start reading and focusing on how can I figure out the meaning of this word out of context, not out of the dictionary, not from the dictionary. So the first two years, use electronic dictionaries up to date. After the two years, do your best. I know you're gonna have a lot of problems, you know, even uh, at the administrative level, because they're going to say, oh, my gosh, how can you ask students to do without looking at the uh, using dictionaries? That is, that is the way you need to help students really build their own vocab before they go on to the third and the fourth year. Otherwise, they're going to continue relying on the dictionary, and they'll never be good translators even after they graduate. Okay, good. Uh, uh, I think this is, will be the last question, which is, was asked earlier from Sharifa Shahrani. She said, can you kindly tell us if you have discussed multimodality in translation in your books? Uh, uh, can you repeat that? I'm sorry, Dr. Mamma. Uh, can you? Uh, tell us if you have discussed multimodality. Multimodalities? In translation. What, 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 what does she mean by multimodalities? Like I have no idea. This is <laughs> what she had to explain. Uh, does she mean methods? Can you explain on the chat, please? Does she mean different models of translation? Does what? Maybe multimodality. Maybe.
pictures and text translation. Pictures? Yes, and text translation. As an in comics. Maybe different sources, text. I, I, is she talking about audiovisuals? That's, uh, I think she means examples. Uh, sorry, this is not clear questions. Can, can be uh, audiovisual. She just uh, put some words. Audiovisual. Mental. Uh, if, if she was talking about different models, and I, I, I probably I know what she was talking about. If she was talking about different models, to me, I always ask the students to go into parallel text. Like, for example, I give them a medical article on Alzheimer's disease. And I will say, okay, before you read, first, first of all, you read the Arabic text and understand what, what, you know, what was the main idea or main, I, what were the main ideas uh, really expressed in the source text. And the minute you understand all the ideas plus the terminology there, go and read models. And when I say models, I mean go and read parallel texts in the English language. Read five, six articles on Alzheimer and see the kind of Trans, the kind of language used in the English about yeah. Alzheimer and see if there is a commonality between the language used in English and the language used in Arabic. And that is the best way to find equivalent terms. You know, instead of focusing on just like literal translation or uh, getting words from the dictionary, you already looked at the, the model, you know, in, in English and you learned exactly what do they use for this word in Arabic. For example, like al-akl al-sharih. You could say al-akl al-sharih in Arabic. It means what? Somebody who, who doesn't, I mean, who eats a lot, right? That's in English. But there is a term when you read about al-akl al-sharih, there is a term in English is called pinch eating. That is a medical term. So instead of using a different terms for al-akl al-sharih in English, when you read parallel text in English, you come up across this term. So you match exactly the term, term in, the same term in English, you match it with that term used in Arabic. So those are, I always say, always look for four or five model articles, model papers, books, uh, that will give you or provide you with the terminology you need when it comes to using technical translation, like scientific, medical, and even sometimes, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, diplomatic translation. Okay, uh, um, probably... This is another question uh, before Dr. Abdullah conclude this session. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Abdullah will uh, have the conclusion and to conclude this session, but we're still waiting for the IT to give him the mic. Meanwhile, uh, there is another question from our colleague Mahaika. He yeah. said, uh, if dubbing is it preferable to text translation in movies? Uh, dubbing? If, uh, is dubbing what? Is preferable? Is preferable? to text translation in movies. <clears throat> is dubbing a preferable method? Or preferred? Of? Let's see, uh, Mahita, can you? Uh, is like it, a, I'm sorry, is, uh, is dubbing a preferable method of translation? A preferable to text translation in movies. I'm sorry, to what? To fit? To text translation How, in movies. To fix? No, no, to text. I, I, I can't hear you clearly when the word after two. To fix, to fix, to fit. Is it preferred to have dubbing in uh, text translation in movies? Oh, I text think. translation. Yes, in movies. In movies. Yes. <clears throat> you see the difference between dubbing and subtitling. Subtitling, you have the translation of... English into Arabic, that is, that is subtitling. Dubbing, which means you dub the sound, the voice. Now, th this requires a lot of, you know, you know, a lot of effort and time just to be able to find the characters and, and do the dubbing. Uh, of course, it's easy. Uh, it's easy for, I don't know for who really, but it's easy for whoever watching a movie is well, to, to, hear the, to hear the text or to hear the characters talking as if it, they're, they're using their native language instead of reading the translation uh, as a subtitle. Now, subtitling takes a lot of time, you know, 
And sometimes, you know, those who read subtitles for movies, they don't enjoy the movie because most of the time they're focusing on the subtitling, on the on reading the subtitling and trying to understand what he was what he's saying. I, I do prefer, you know, if you want to, uh, you know, let's say if you want to uh, translate a movie, you know, I, I would prefer dubbing over subtitling. Great. Uh, uh, the, now, uh, Dr. Abdullah, do uh, you have the mic or you are unmuted? Dr. Abdullah Al-Milhi, Riyadh, can you take the mic with Dr. Abdullah? Dr. Abdullah Al-Milhi. Excuse me. Now we can see you before uh, the video is... Can you, can you see me? Uh... Right now. Where is that? What is that? The video at the bottom of the room. Riyadh, can you tell me, Dr. Abdullah? Inshallah, for uh, our next webinar will be January 3rd, and uh, it will be about uh, research methods. And our uh, uh, presenter will be Dr. Uh, Professor James Dean Brown uh, from University of Hawaii mm -hmm. at Manawa. <coughs> Uh, Dr. Shayab, if you would like to join us, you can join us from there. Oh yeah, definitely, James Brown. I know that. I know that. I know. I know that. I know James well, and and I know he's going to do an excellent job too. Inshallah. Uh, and we uh, apologize that we could not have more than 100 participants in this room, but inshallah, we will try to fix it uh, next time, and we will increase uh, the uh, the number of the participants to be more than 100. Yeah, definitely, definitely. You need to have a larger space uh, or place, inshallah. And uh, and I'll be more than happy to give maybe another uh, workshop sometimes. Just you know, if if there's something you know in mind, you or Dr. Abdullah, you want me just to uh, introduce. You know, I just want to make sure I provide the uh, you know help in terms of the gaps that are existing. You know, you know, overseas. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Dr. Nasser, Dr. Uh, Sayyid, yes. Salaam Alaikum. Salaam Alaikum, Dr. Tawul Amra. Ayyakum Allah. And um, first, I would like to thank you for this insightful uh, presentation. Uh, indeed, you have sailed us through smoothly through this, you know, the ocean of, of translation. Thank it, you. It is a very tough and, and difficult, you know, subject and a specialty to be in. I'd like also to thank all participants who joined us. We reached 100 participants, as Dr. Nasser have said already, and we, uh, we apologize for those who tried to you know, join us and, and couldn't because of the limitation. The uh, maximum number was uh, 100, and we will increase it in, in, the, in the future. Uh, your presentation, actually, uh, Dr. Shayab, is, is, is uh, wonderful. Uh, one in, in, in my opinion, it's just not, not a question, but a comment that mm -hmm. a translator should, um, should have uh, the experience, the intuition, the knowledge, right. and, and the combination of all of, all of that. And I, I do agree with you in regards to the, the uh, you know, translation of the already borrowed and known terminologies such as the internet and, and right. Those you know uh, terminologies that are already well known, and we you know it's not you know uh, it's not wrong to borrow from you know other languages. Actually, it is a, a language is is, is called a, a, you know a life language if it continues to borrow and to lend uh, you know uh, different you know words and their terminologies. Um, <laughs> I remember, I remember, you know, the attempt of the, um, uh, I think, uh, uh, I forgot the name, but it is, um, uh, you know, um, an institution in Egypt, I believe, in which, you know, it, it deals with the, the new words that, you know, um, exist and needs to be translated into Arabic. And um, they try to translate the uh, sandwich. And the sandwich <laughs> is a very, you know, easy concept known all over you know, the Arab world to, to, to be, you know, precise and to translate it into shatir wa mashtur wa something, you know. It's, it's odd, <laughs> really, it's odd. 
So I, I do agree with you that you know we should actually open a, our, our doors for uh, yes terminology. You know, to, uh, you, you know yes. I, I'm I'm glad I'm glad to hear you saying this because because when I was teaching overseas, like you know I taught 15 years at Yamuk University, set up the MA program there, uh, UAE University, University of, you know just in, I'm saying in the in the Middle East. You know, I, I, I taught at the University of Geneva, then Indiana, then came here. I had no issues here, unfortunately. Uh, but when I was overseas, just they look at borrowing as if you are distorting the, the Arabic language. I said, that's not true. Because even the Quran borrowed from, the, from other languages. The Quran, that's the word of God. So if God has borrowed terms from other languages, there is no, there's no justification why we cannot really borrow. Particularly when it comes to what? To enriching the Arabic language. I mean, um, in just you know, translating, uh, you know, maybe forcing, forcing terms on, on people, although they do not make sense, that is not going to be conducive to, to the Arabic language or even to Arabic readers. Um, like a set sandwich, sandwich, it's easy. Everybody knows what a sandwich is, but I bet you, I mean, it sounds funny when you say that doesn't make sense. And, you know, one word is translated into two sentences. You know, borrow the term, you enrich the Arabic language, and actually you make it easy for people to understand even, you know, that kind of common language between the Arabic and the English and vice versa. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, it seems that one, my comments uh, actually annoyed one of the participants. Her name is <laughs> her name is Karima, and I don't, you know, uh, this is a, my personal opinion, not King Khalid University. So, yes. uh, Sister Karima, if you, if you uh, go back and, and listen and, and re-listen to my you know comment, I don't represent King Khalid University. I represent myself. So, uh, thanks for uh, you know your comment. Um, you know, I, we don't want to take long. Um, one of the participants actually. Uh, asked us to have more sessions in, uh, you know, translation, and we would be in touch with you through uh, Dr. Munasser and, uh, you know, through the deanship of uh, the uh, e-learning. And I would like in this, you know, uh, moment to thank everyone who participated, and I special thanks are, should go to uh, Dr. Fahd al and the, the team uh, of the e-learning. I know that uh, we have uh, two wonderful look colleagues who have been you know, with us throughout the session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, I would leave the mic for you, Dr. Uh, Shayab, if you want to conclude. And I thank uh, again everybody for participating and for being with us. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, well, thank you. I, I just want to, before I forget, I want to thank, I want to thank uh, Dr. Ihab Badruddin, who's uh, teaching in the, the, in the faculty of, uh, you know, languages and translation and and he, he is the, office, the liaison office, officer, actually, and he's been in touch with me. And, and uh, he is actually the communicator or the moderator between me and all those involved in e-learning uh, uh, and the workshop on translation. I really, I really appreciate all the effort he did. And, uh, and to me, without him, probably uh, things would have, many things would have been lost and we, we would have not even been able to do that. He was always on, on top of everything and I really appreciate that. I want to make sure if he's around, if he heard me or if he is there with you, I want him to know that. Uh, yeah, when, yeah, he is with us and I, I really, um, you know, forgot to mention him. I, yeah. Uh, Dr. Ahab is one of uh, our best, you know, uh, colleagues and, and instructors and, uh, you know, he has yes. courses and, in translation and, and I know that you, you know, you supervised his... Yes. Uh, uh, dissertation PhD dissertation and um, he spoke highly and proudly about you yes yeah and in terms of the future workshop or sessions you know and even when I was when I was asked to do this with all honesty uh, you know I could have talked about let's say um, the transition industry or maybe how technology affected the transition industry but I thought about I thought those who are going to be attending or participating in that kind of workshop they, most of them, they want to. <clears throat> excuse me. Most of them, they want to know what is what is going on when it comes to translation. How can this workshop, uh, you know, how can this workshop help them understand translation, translation better, translation techniques, and that's why I thought the the, the audience is going to be different. They're not all going to be colleagues teaching at universities. 
not they're not going to be all students, you know, t- learning translation, and some of those even probably participating after the one hundred something. You know, some of them they're interested to know, you know, what is involved in translation. So I I did my best to make sure that the subject is uh, of general nature. But in the future, if there is something specific that maybe King Khalid University, you, the college, or somebody else in the in the university, they wanted mainly specifically about X and Y and Z to graduate students, or maybe I'll be more than happy to do it. Yes, yes, tr- uh, sure. Okay, Dr. Munasar, do you have something to conclude, or uh, shall we conclude uh, the session? Just one request from uh, the participant that uh, if you could uh, send me, uh, me or the PowerPoint slides of the presentation. I can hear you. I'm sorry, Dr. Uh, Hamami. He's, he's requesting you uh, to, if, if it's possible, to uh, email him or send the uh, PowerPoint, you know, uh, link or slides. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I'll go ahead and share send it. it. To, sh- yeah. to share it with those who are interested. No problem. I will go ahead and send it. Just uh, let Dr. Hamami email me, requesting that he needs the uh, the pop of the pitch so I can I can I can um, mail him back the, uh, the the file. Thank you. Okay. Okay. No problem. Thanks a lot. It, Any it other was, questions? It was, it was a pleasure having you. It was pleasure really doing it for you for you, and uh, I really enjoyed it. Although with with the constraint of time, and well, it's not very know, convenient. Uh, you, you know, there is a... because I'm 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 looking. You know, um, you know, um, at the screen, I don't see any any of you guys, and and I don't hear you well. I hope in the future, hopefully, we're going to be able to talk as if we are sitting next to each other. Hopefully, hopefully in the future. Thank you. And all the best to everybody, and, uh, and it's nice talking to you all, and and have and, a good day. And enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you. You too. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody. This is the conclusion, and you can leave the room. And Riyadh. Hello. Hello. Riyadh, I'll take over the session. خلاص خلصنا. Hello. Okay, we are done. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Bye bye. I'm going to exit now. We are done. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Bye bye. I'm going to exit now.